Thank you for joining the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston for our weekly online ministers forum. I'm the Reverend Dr. Colin Bosson, Senior Minister of the Congregation. These programs are conversations with community organizers, scholars, religious leaders, artists, and others about how we can collectively address the present crises. Their purpose is to offer members of our community and all who wish to join us online science-based resources and liberation-oriented inspiration to get us through these difficult times. Today I'm joined by Professor Felipe Hinojoso. We'll be talking about his new book, Apostles of Change, Latino Radical Politics, Church Occupations, and the Fight to Save the Barrio. Dr. Hinojosa is the director of the Carlos H. Cantu Hispanic Education and Opportunity Endowment and an associate professor of history at Texas A&M University. He earned his PhD from the University of Houston and has published widely on Chicano and Latinx studies, religion, race, and social movements. Dr. Hinojosa, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here with you all today. I'm wondering if you could just start out by offering us a brief overview of your book. Sure. Um, you know, the, the book is situated in a relatively short uh, period of time. I mean, I'm essentially writing about uh, the middle part of 1969 up until the early part of 1970. So about 10, a 10 month period essentially is what I'm uh, writing about. And I'm looking at this phenomena that um, spread across American cities of radical, um, you know, activists and organizers in American cities and in neighborhoods that started to use and started to occupy churches as a platform to push back against urban renewal. Um, and urban renewal in the 1960s uh, and certainly even in the in going as far back as 1950s and late 1940s begins to affect uh, mostly heavily black and brown and working class neighborhoods in cities across the United States and really displacing families uh, and pushing them uh, essentially across the city, forcing them to find new spots to live in and so forth. Um, and in 1969, I think people had just had enough um, and organizers that were pushing back against this movement of urban renewal start to occupy churches as a way to get churches involved in the movement to stop uh, urban renewal and to uh, assist low-income uh, and working families uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, and I'm looking at uh, specifically within a Latino context. Um, you know, the book looks at four major American cities, the four largest cities in the United States, uh, New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston, not just because they're the four largest cities uh, and the most uh, diverse cities in America, but also because these are the spots where uh, these occupations took on not just a, a kind of a local, um, you know, uh, phenomenon just that, that took off locally, but also because it made national news and it sparked attention, got the attention of folks all over um, the country. There were more occupations, not just in those four cities that I write about, but of course I wanted to finish writing the book and, and uh, focused on those, uh, on those areas there. And I look at, again at specifically uh, Latino neighborhoods, Puerto Rican neighborhoods in uh, New York City and in Chicago and Mexican-American uh, neighborhoods in Los Angeles and Houston. So why is it important to look at Latino neighborhoods um, in, in the book? I mean, why not look at, you know, African Americans, for instance, or focus on, uh, you know, other occupation movements that were taking place at this time? Well, first of all, I'm a Latino historian, right? I was trained at the University of Houston, as you mentioned, um, and really trained in studying the Mexican American experience in the United States, um, and quickly learned that once you start to get into the Mexican-American experience, it becomes a Latino experience. Uh, these are neighborhoods that in the late 60s and 70s and certainly since uh, have transformed tremendously from heavily Mexican areas or Puerto Rican areas in the Northeast uh, to a much more diverse uh, grouping of people from all over the Caribbean or Latin America. Um, and in particular, uh, for Latinos and, and for Latino history, the barrio is central. The barrio is uh, the place where the big things of history happen. Um, 
you know, uh, there are, you know, not only uh, big things that come out of that, uh, you know, the, the small voters across the United States, but these are also areas that for the most part lack resources. And, um, you know, the barrio is the place where these movements initiate and where they get started. And so for me, it was central to write about the barrio because one of the main stories about the barrio in the United States is a story of displacement and the ways in which Latinos have been pushed around because of urban renewal and now in a current phenomenon of gentrification. Um, and we don't really know too much about that and the way that it's affected Latinos in the United States, especially historically going back to the 60s. There's some newer books that have been coming out as of late. Uh, but this is a, a, an area of our uh, history that, that there still remains a tremendous gap. And so I wanted to be able to tell this story and really tell the story of how Latinos organized to push back against this when they really had begun to have enough of constantly being pushed around and displaced from neighborhood to neighborhood. One of the things though, that I think your book does, right, is that it um, it challenges kind of the idea that the movements like the Young Lords, for instance, or Mayo here in uh, Houston, um, that I think their rhetoric was often, um, you know, fairly secular, sometimes Marxist, revolutionary nationalist. Um, you're saying, well, we can only understand these movements actually if we place them in dialogue with uh, religion. And um, I think that that's like one of the, you know, the, the major contributions of the book. And I, I wonder if you could kind of talk a bit more about like why, well, sort of why that contribution is important and also what it does for changing our thinking about not just uh, social movements in the United States, but also religion in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think first I, I, I'd just like to start to just by, by you know, giving a little bit, a bit of uh, background. Um, the Young Lords, as you mentioned, are a uh, predominantly, although not completely, uh, Puerto Rican uh, radical organization that started initially um, as a street gang in Chicago in the late 1950s, came to political consciousness uh, with their leader, Jose Chacha Jimenez, uh, in the late 1960s, um, and really began to pay attention to the issues that the Puerto Rican community in Chicago was, in effect, raising around police brutality, around displacement and poverty. Um, that movement spreads to New York City, where a group of college students there start their movement and start to develop their um, uh, response and their their timing uh, for the community there. Uh, and then from there it goes, um, you know, these other movements uh, also begin to spread, although they don't get started just in Chicago and New York. Mexican Americans have a long tradition of radical organizing, especially within labor movements. Um, but in these urban contexts, you see young Mexican Americans begin uh, to rise up and take on issues such as welfare rights, poverty, police brutality, voting rights, uh, educational reform, all of these things. And really they are um, looking on intently. Mayo is another one. Mayo stands for the Mexican American Youth Organization. Uh, in Los Angeles, the group that I write about is a group called Catolicos por la Raza, uh, or Catholics for the People or for the Race, that was really a who's who of organizers from all across the city of Los Angeles. And these are young people that are watching intently on the black freedom struggle and the black uh, power movement um, and looking at folks such as Stokely Carmichael and Fred Hampton in Chicago um, and others and really trying to model their movements and trying to situate them within a specific Latino context in the United States. Um, and so you see there's a lot of similarities between these groups but they're also distinct in the ways in which they deal with, uh, with their issues um, that are pertinent to their particular neighborhoods. Um, to your question about religion, religion in, in what I'm trying to make an argument in this book is that religious politics are really fueling this surge of Latino radical politics. Um, and I know that might sound contradictory, but um, essentially what, what that means is that it is religious organizations that are closely partnering with young people in these urban areas. Uh, 
uh, providing them space. In Los Angeles, it was Church of the Epiphany um, that is providing space to a radical uh, Mexican-American organization called the Brown Berets. Um, it's also, the church is also providing space for, um, you know, folks within the movement to develop and create their newspaper. Um, and in Chicago, uh, the Armitage Methodist Church led by, uh, the Reverend Bruce and Eugenia Johnson are also providing space and also collaborating. There's other neighborhood ministries, it's a whole sort of history of radical and progressive religious politics that is really lining up with these young folks um, and trying to collaborate with them as much as possible. So it's fueling these these radical movements because it's providing them space uh, and otherwise. Um, the, the, the book is situated within that context, but also how these radical organizers begin to push back against uh, other religious and more conservative religious institutions in the barrio and in the neighborhoods that were not as willing to participate with them. And I think when you begin to look at those politics, you begin to see, number one, that um, uh, first of all, Latinos uh, have a long history of engaging their religious leaders and their religious clergy. Uh, and number two, by the late 1960s, even though you have a long history of Latinos being Protestants and certainly, you know, 500 year history of being Catholics and so forth, um, that, um, that Latinos are still not very well understood, that we are still a um, invisible minority in the late 1960s. Um, you know, Presbyterians and Methodists uh, really knew very little about our communities. Uh, mainline Protestants were somewhat puzzled by our movements um, and didn't understand, uh, in many cases, what young people were trying to do uh, in that era and in that movement. Um, and what these radicals do is sort of bring to light the Latino context and really force churches, including the Catholic Church, even though Latinos have a longer history with Catholicism, it's these young radicals that really sort of raise, um, uh, you know, the, the level of understanding and really demand that the church pay attention to their struggle. I mean, you're talking about radicals. I think one thing, one concept from sociology that you use in the book uh, a lot is this thing called the radical flank effect, um, which I think is, I'd like you to talk about a little bit more in depth here and how it plays out in the book, because it's, I think it, it really disrupts kind of some of the ways people think about the politics, politics on sort of the left liberal spectrum of like either or ism, like either you're a radical or you're a reformist, because it really, I think, changes kind of the way we think about social change happening. So what is the radical flank effect? And, you know, could you give us an example of it from the book? Sure. Yeah. The radical flank effect is, is this notion, this theoretical idea that looks at the role that radicals play in improving the positionality of reformers in social movements. Um, in other words, it's, it's really radicals within the movements, the dreamers, the, the people with the big imagination, the people that are going at the systemic root of social injustice, the people that are asking and demanding um, for social and political systemic change, they're really the ones that um, open it up and make it possible for reformers, people that are essentially working within the system and essentially working within either denominations or religious groups or otherwise, or the educational system, um, you know, to, to just reform what's already um, existent, right? Um, that it's these radicals that, that push reformers to the very front uh, in terms of uh, providing them the kind of attention uh, that they need. And that's essentially what happens and what I write about uh, in this book, because uh, Latinos had already been a part of what many people know of already in terms of the farm worker movement uh, and Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in Central California. Um, there were many Latino mainline Protestants that were marching with Caesar, that were out there um, and, and really sort of bringing to the pews, bringing to their churches a kind of radical mandate for, for the support of these farm workers. Um, but even with all of that involvement and even Latino Catholics, right? Latino Protestants and Catholics, even with all of that involvement, 
um, Latino mainline uh, Protestants especially um, had very little negotiating space. Um, denominate white denominational leaders at the at the very highest level, uh, and I'm talking about the National Council of Churches in New York City, um, knew very little about who these denominational leaders were. They knew Cesar Chavez and they knew Dolores Huerta, but they didn't know Lidia Lopez or they didn't know Roger Granados, um, you know, some of these Presbyterian leaders that I write about uh, in this book. And interestingly enough, even after five or so years of advocating for farm worker rights within the churches, it's these young people in urban communities, it's these radicals that are outside of the church, they're not a part of the church, that occupy these churches and really recenter these reformers and bring them to the center of denominational politics. Um, I don't think it happens without them. Um, I think these occupations are sort of a tipping point for the kind of uh, engagement that Latino and Latina clergy began to uh, participate in uh, within church uh, within church politics in both Catholic and in Protestant uh, circles. So I want to turn our conversation to Houston since it's it's one of the places you really f focus on. Oh, actually, although I, before I do that, um, I mean I think that what you're talking about in terms of the radical reform dynamic is something we can see in social movements and in you know, not just in churches across the country. I mean, one thinks immediately of the dynamic between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, that people, you know, that Peniel Joseph has written about recently, for instance, um, and before him, James Cone. Uh, and I, I think that, like, in terms of as those of us who are active in social movements, um, so often there is this sort of dichotomy of either you're a reformist or you're a revolutionary, maybe it's a little bit more helpful to think about what one's positioning allows one to sort of push issues one way or another. And I think that your book sort of provides some really helpful illustrations and thinking through of that, especially because you don't necessarily portray these inside reformists as fully in opposition to or always in opposition to the sort of more outside revolutionaries, but in many instances sort of cooperating across the line, <laughs> lines. You know, it, one of the things that I, you know, especially begins to happen is you have these Latino clergy that are saying, hey, wait a minute, we've been drafting proposals. We've been trying to organize things here in the city. We've marched with Cesar Chavez in California and even in our local context. And we've asked you for these things for the last five or six years. And you've always declined. You've rejected us or you've turned away. And yet here come these young radicals and, and now you're willing to open up, you know, the bank and, and give them whatever they want. Um, they used what these radicals were doing in terms of the occupations to better their position. And and that's at the heart of, of the book. The other side of that is that I think sometimes when we talk about radicalism and when we talk about radical politics, we forget that radicalism does not. Uh, mean irresponsibility. It does not mean that people are not organizing or thinking through their processes. In fact, they're probably even thinking about those processes, uh, processes even more. Um, and that's what you see in the book. You see radicals that would have seen the church as the enemy of the people, right? Or the opiate of the people, uh, to use, you know, that Marx phrase. Um, but you see them negotiating with religious leaders. You see them engaging religious leaders. You see them asking for permission to use church sanctuaries. It's really quite phenomenal to see how well organized some of these radicals and, and these movements were. And I think it helped. I think it should help us to reorient what we think about, as you mentioned, this dichotomy between being a radical and being a reformist. Uh, I think the lines blur a lot more than than we sometimes think they do. Well, and I mean, one of the things you really emphasize in that comment there, and I think is very true, is that oftentimes radicals, in terms of like the grassroots level of organizing, are in many ways the most pragmatic. You know, let's just yeah. start a breakfast program. Like, let's not worry about all of this other stuff, like all of the red tape around this or whatever. Let's just start a, a, a breakfast, you know, program. I mean, people need childcare. Let's start childcare. We'll worry about the, you know, um, ins and outs, the legality of that, and the structure of that, and all that stuff after we get it up and running. Absolutely, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a that's a great point. 
So I do want to, and actually the, I think story in Houston really highlights that. So I'd like you to sort of talk about the Mexican American Youth Organization and uh, its, its sort of history, the church occupation they did here, and, um, you know, its, its impact. Yeah, you know, the, the Mexican American Youth Organization uh, was a statewide organization. It starts in San Antonio uh, about 1967-68. Um, with a group of, you know, young, energetic, highly intelligent Mexican-American leaders that begin to um, think about pushing harder uh, against the kind of Texas political machine that had oppressed and marginalized Mexican-Americans in this state, in Texas. Um, when they organize, um, you know, it's, one of the first things they do, and Jose Angel Gutierrez, which is a major political leader in Texas and, and certainly somebody that is well known within the Chicano movement uh, in this state, helped to start La Raza Unida political third party uh, here in the state and across the country. One of the things that he says right away is that, look, we we got in a car and we, we went to Atlanta. We went to the Deep South. We wanted to learn from black student leaders that were also you know, heavily involved in these movements. Um, and so Mayo or the Mexican American Youth Organization really begins to take on this mantra. They were a very well organized group. They had a set of bylaws. They had a set of code of ethics, a way of doing things, a way of organizing. They were in the Rio Grande Valley. They were in Houston. They were in San Antonio uh, and all over the state. Uh, in Houston, they actually had two chapters, one at the University of Houston and the other one that I write about, uh, which was just known as Barrio Mayo uh, in the North Side Barrio. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a group of young people that is trying to find their way. They're, they're trying to sort of make a statement and trying to do something positive in their neighborhood. Um, and they are realistic about how much it is that they can do and the impact they can have. And so they're very committed to the North Side. And that's the area that I write about uh, in, this particular, uh, in this particular book. They did a church occupation there. Uh, could you talk about that a bit more in detail? Yeah, sure. So Mayo, one, one of the things about Mayo is that, uh, and I, you know, when I was doing some of the oral histories, it was just funny to get to know some of these folks that, that are still around and, and just, you know, contributed a great deal to the kind of mutual aid politics that uh, has a long tradition in the city of Houston. Um, you know, but but it's interesting because Alex Rodriguez and others that I spoke to um, really point to the moment when they took a road trip to Chicago in 1968 and they met, um, you know, the chairman of the Black Panther Party, the Illinois chapter. They met Fred Hampton. They met um, Jose Chacha Jimenez, both of which are, if you watch the, you know, the film that's out now, um, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, Jose Chacha Jimenez plays a small role in that film, but he's part of this rainbow coalition, this vision that Fred Hampton had for urban politics and urban um, coalition building between not only Latinos and African Americans, but also uh, working class white communities in, the, in these neighborhoods. They meet these folks and it was a life changing experience for them. They, um, you know, uh, come back to Houston energized about doing something positive in the North Side. They meet, um, you know, after that trip, they meet a young woman, a young Mexican immigrant woman um, that is uh, Yolanda Garza Birdwell, um, who, um, you know, was born in Houston, but had moved back to Mexico uh, and mm. came back to Houston when she was 18 years old. Uh, she lives in the Montrose area, so she's, you know, kind of a part of the, the, the kind of radical politics that were happening in that era in the 1960s there. Um, she meets her husband, Walter Birdwell, there. They marry and then decide that they're going to have just kind of a different kind of marriage. They're going to be involved politically all across the city of Houston. They connect and find their way to meet these young Mexican-American activists um, and Yolanda stood out, right? And as I write in the book, Yolanda spoke Spanish very well. She was married to an Anglo. Um, Mayo was, uh, in some respects, 
you know, tied to a kind of cultural national politics, cultural nationalist politics that, you know, really sort of put Mexican American politics at the forefront and devalued coalition building. That changes when they meet Fred Hampton mm. and, and Chacha Jimenez up in Chicago. And so when they come back to Houston, there's white folks in, in Barrio Mayo, there's Mexican Americans. They're very much about, they're collaborating where they can with African American movements. There's a sense that you've got to build coalitions if you're going to do anything. Mayo, Mexican American Youth Organization in Houston, was savvy about that. Houston is also experiencing a lot of change in the late 1960s. The, the highways that are being built and that are spreading and expanding this city that would become what it is today uh, are being built around this time. And people are moving to these newly developed suburbs. This creates a crisis point for churches that have to follow their flock, or at least that's the sense that they have. And they really start to believe that the inner city and the area in and around downtown is deteriorating quickly. And the best thing to do is to move and start these churches that were in and around downtown, move them and start them now in these new developing suburbs, Katy, Spring, all of these other areas that start to take off um, in the early 1970s. Um, so that's the case that happens here in the north side. Christ Presbyterian Church, the entire congregation, which had been slowly losing membership in the 1960s as folks were moving to the suburbs, decides to close down. The building is empty for a number of months. And Mayo, you know, looking at the young lords and what they had done in Chicago with occupying the Armitage Methodist Church, decide that they're going to occupy this Christ Presbyterian Church. It's empty, but they don't break into it. They go to the Brazos Presbytery. They ask for permission to use the building. And without getting too much into the weeds here, um, the Brazos Presbytery declines their um, request to use the building. And they instead offer the building to another Mexican-American congregation that moves in. And that's when Mayo occupies the building, turns it into what they call the Northside People's Center um, they had a breakfast program. They had cultural education classes. They had welfare rights movements or groups from the city meet there. Meanwhile, you've got this new Mexican-American congregation that's waiting to move in, the Juan Marcos Presbyterian Church. And so really the chapter is about this tension that gets created between a Mexican-American radical organization and a Mexican-American Protestant uh, church. And that's what plays out in the chapter that I write on in Houston. Well, thank you. And I, I would encourage people to uh, read the chapter and read the book but, uh, in more depth to get a, a better sense of it, because it's a really fascinating history. And I think, actually, you have some interesting things to say about sort of Houston, the dynamics of Houston overall. We are um, running sort of near the end of to our time. And I know that one of the kind of real contributions you're trying to make is to help us rethink the left or the religious left in the United States, and kind of make point really arguing that, you know, it didn't disappear after King was assassinated. There's something that is missed if we just focus on clergy, because the church remains a site of social state change through these sort of grassroots movements and efforts. And your book ends in, well, I mean, it really ends, like you say, you know, you've got this 10 month period, but then you follow some of the characters uh, in the conclusion and other parts up until say the mid 1980s. But um, I, I know you're a historian, but I'd love to hear you sort of reflect on, you know, how do these dynamics continue to play out? Where is the religious left? How do grassroots political movements play out in it? Um, you know, what are the kind of things we should be paying attention to coming from this this book in today's contemporary moment? Great question. I mean, I think one of one of the areas or one of the things that really started to really bother me <laughs> about some of the historical writing that was being done on the religious left uh, had to do with the fact that for whatever reason, we were, uh, our historians were writing about the kind of decline of the religious left and the rise of the moral majority. Uh, we have been enamored for decades now with explaining and understanding the rise of conservatism in American religious politics. As important as that is, it has left a huge gap in our historical understanding of the religious left and of progressive religious politics in the United States. And I want to, I want us to sort of clarify too, that uh, 
I know that when we talk about the religious left, it can be sort of a minefield because it's so complicated, many different factions, uh, different movements that emerge from there. But uh, I think in terms of thinking about progressive politics or in terms of thinking about the church as an organizing base and thinking about the church as involved in uh, community justice movements, um, one of the things that I found right away was that if you focus on American politics writ large, um, it's, it's easy to jump immediately to the religious right. They had the bullhorn in the late 1970s and probably ever since. What I'm trying to point people back to, uh, and maybe this is kind of more anthropological on my side, I'm really trying to point people back to the local, to the hyper-local, to the specific because if we don't do that, we miss uh, the power of progressive religious politics in the United States, primarily because um, the religious left didn't go anywhere. It didn't die. It didn't disappear after King's assassination. It got to work, in fact. But it got to work in local neighborhoods, um, building movements, and then in the 1980s, becoming part of one of the most powerful movements uh, to speak back against the U.S. federal government, not only in its refusal to acknowledge uh, asylum seekers, but in its involvement in Central America. And I don't think that happens without the kind of infrastructure and organizing base that is built in religious communities in the 1970s, led heavily, I might add, by black and brown and working and white working class churches. Uh, that's a central part of understanding the kind of movements that have continued and what you even see today with uh, Reverend uh, William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign or the kind of new imagining of the Poor People's Campaign that he has launched in, in recent years. Um, for me, you know, when people talk about Latino religious politics, oftentimes, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an immediate jump to sort of get at you know, well, religion leads directly to conservative politics within Latino communities, right? Um, you know, maybe that's true. I suppose that, that to some extent it is. Um, but for me, the greater miracle is when Latino religious politics is uh, progressive, when it's building coalitions with other churches and other radical movements. Um, and we have to remember that if we think about immigrant rights today, and certainly the sanctuary movement in churches providing space to asylum seekers, that it's a longer history than just the 1980s. It goes further back to Latino Pentecostal churches, to kind of the long history of this trans-border mutual aid that has been functioning within Latino churches for over 100 years, maybe even longer than that. And so I think it's important for us to realize that and then also uh, get to work in, in, in terms of trying to better understand this because it has implications for future elections. It has implications for an organizing base as we move uh, forward. Um, as the young people say today, don't sleep on the Latino church and Latino religious politics because it is a powerful force to organize people. And it's got a longer tradition of radical organizing, probably a lot longer than a lot of people realize. And I think my book was a small contribution to just sort of get at not only uh, the potential and the possibilities within church spaces, but also how it is that Latino churches begin to make the journey to engage radical politics and then stay engaged in those movements. Well, thank you so much, Felipe, for uh, joining us and for that wonderful overview of your book. I really encourage people to go read it when you get a chance. Um, it's from University of Texas Press, and it just came out this year. For those of you who are with us for the first time, let me say a few words about Unitarian Universalism. We're a religious tradition that celebrates the possibility of goodness within each human heart, the transformative power of love, and the clarifying force of reason. We believe we need not think alike to love alike. If you found this video to be helpful, please consider joining us for our weekly online worship service. It's posted each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Central, and features music and prayers in addition to a sermon this week, we'll be celebrating Mother's Day in English and Spanish. The Reverend D. Scott Cooper will be preaching the English language service, and I'll be preaching the Spanish language one. Thank you to our staff for making this video possible. It was produced by Christian Holmes. Alma Vizcarra assisted with the editing.
We'll see you all online soon and in person as soon as we can gather again.